what I'm hoping that we'll get out of this series. So the first question I want to ask is a little bit of an existential question, really, in a way. Why are we here? Um, now, I'm really just referring to this evening's um, session. Why are we here? Well, I hope it's because you're interested in this statement of the evangelist Mark. He starts his gospel with the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's the first, your Mark chapter one, verse one. So this gospel is all about Jesus. And therefore what we're doing this evening is trying to get to know Jesus through Mark's gospel. There will be a lot of intellectual content that I will throw at you this evening. Don't worry if you don't take it all in. But I profoundly believe with Thomas Aquinas that our faith is not just a faith. It's a faith of our minds as well as our hearts. So I'm hoping to stimulate your minds, but also so that your hearts will be uh, turned even more to Jesus. And so although I'll be showing a lot of, as I say, interesting, hopefully, intellectual content, its main purpose is to draw us close to Jesus. Now, tonight's session, as I said in, the, um, in your participant guide, is slightly different from the others because my aim this evening is really to give you a, an introduction to the whole gospel. Um, so in future weeks, so this week there'll be quite a lot of me, unfortunately, but in future weeks there'll be rather a little bit less of me and a little bit more of you in your discussion groups. But this session is really an introduction to a tour. You might recognise um, Disneyland, maybe some of you have been. I used to live in Florida. Um, I used to work for IBM and I was living in Florida. And before we came back to the UK, my wife and I decided that we would have to go to Disneyland in Orlando and take our four-year-old and two-year-old at the time. Now, at the time, going to Disneyland was a bit of a military operation and there were people publishing books. They're probably blogs these days, but people publish books about the right way to get through Disneyland and avoid the queues. And they tell you, go here and queue there and go through that path and go through this little angle. So I, I liken what I'm doing this evening to try and giving you some of those tips to get through and find the right ways to find the right parts of the gospel. But another image I want to use, um, the picture at the bottom here is Google Street View. And it's actually, of that's my house there on the left. And um, that's actually me with the car, by the way. But I use Google Street View whenever I'm going somewhere new. I like to go and look at Google Street View before I travel. Because for me, looking at the pictures of where you're going to be, is much better than hearing somebody say, go third left and the pub on the right and etc. I don't do too well with that. So I really prefer to look and see the signs before I travel. So that's what I'm hoping to do. I'm hoping to give you some of the signs. You don't have to take them all in, but hopefully as you come across these things in the subsequent weeks, you'll say, oh yeah, he mentioned that, didn't he? So that's what I'm trying to do this evening. A few um, I feel the need to um, explain myself or apologize in advance for a few things as well. Um, so I'm just going to go through each of these three topics in, in turn. So you've been bombarded with emails saying the Gospel of Mark. Now, I did use that title for publicizing the series, but I'm actually in error. In fact, Mark himself would not have approved of my talking about the gospel of Mark and his friend, the apostle Paul would have even less approved in the letter to Galatians. He is very clear that there is only one gospel and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, there is, and so actually what we're looking at is the gospel according to Mark, kata Markon. And if you see on these little screens over here on the right hand side you see there the little circle i don't know whether you can see those letters but the um don't know how well you read greek either but anyway that says you can see you probably see the kata fairly easily kata markon that's actually the front that's the very start of mark's gospel 
and here at the bottom is the end. Just in case you've forgotten who you were reading, it says Katamarkon at the end. This is actually from um, the Codex Vaticanus, which is one of the early fourth century um, manuscripts that we use as the basis um, for many of our um, versions of the Bible today. Anyway, Katamarkon, according to Mark. Only one gospel, it's about Jesus Christ, but this one is according to Mark. Now, so from now on, I'm just going to refer to Mark, and I'm going to use Mark in two ways. I'm going to use it when talking about the gospel. So I might just say, well, Mark is like this, whereas Luke and Matthew are like this. But I also might use Mark to refer to the author. And I'm going to talk about that um, in, a, in, in the second session, which is after our breakout group. So gospel of Mark, I still might use it in my emails to you for, for, for to, just to keep things short. But really, it should be according to. So there's my first apology. My second apology is that this whole presentation this evening is full of spoiler alerts. But of course, you've most of you have hopefully had a chance to read the gospel now, um, so you won't need the spoiler. And anyway, most of us know how it starts and how it ends. Nearly everything I'm going to say is in some way going to anticipate some part of the Mark's gospel. Um, and you may remember the old days when they were doing the football results or something, didn't they? They said, if you don't want to know what happened, look away now. Maybe that ages me. But anyway, they used to say that on the sports programs. Um, don't look away now, obviously. But uh, that's the sort of thing. The whole of Mark, though, is actually prefaced by a spoiler. Verse one, chapter one, verse one, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God. He's told you pretty much everything there is to know right at the start. And so that's the context for the whole of the gospel. So we already know the story. We already know what's going to happen. I guess the key question for us is, and this is the question that reading Mark's gospel asks us again and again. We know what happened. Are we accepting it and applying it to ourselves? That's the really big question. I'm also going to be talking quite a lot about literary features. And you might think, well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? What's that got to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, I think I can defend that it is appropriate because our church teaching on scripture emphasizes that all scripture is both human and divine. It has a divine author, the Holy Spirit, but there is a human element to it. Pope Francis, in, in one of um, in a, a letter he wrote last year um, called Aperuit Illis, talked about sacred scripture through the working of the Holy Spirit actually makes human words that are written in human fashion become the word of God. So just as Jesus divine became human, our human words become the divine word of God through the transforming power of God. And the Vatican documents on scripture actually advise us to look at the literary forms of scripture. So Dei Verbum, which is the Vatican II document on um, the principally talks about scripture. Um, in, in paragraph 12, it says you need to look at literary forms to search out what the intention of the sacred writers is. So this is an entirely valid thing to be doing. So, OK, you say, well, all right, Deacon Martin, I'll I'll buy that it's appropriate. Um, is it actually true? Is it needed? Is it does it really happen? All these things you're telling us that Mark did, did he really do all of those? Did he work all that out? Well, you can judge for yourself. But what I can tell you is that patterning, which we're going to see a lot of this evening, patterns in the in the in the in the work was actually a big part of Mark's world and a part of the ancient world altogether. Or by oral culture, I mean the, the culture of telling stories without them being written down. That's still active in Bedouin and other cultures today. But we have oral culture. Anybody who's read a, a nursery story, a fairy story to their children or grandchildren will know that we oral culture still is very important to us. So that's one element of why patterns matter. But also there's something called rhetoric, which I will talk about a little bit more later. 
we most scholars think that Mark had a working knowledge of rhetoric, which means patterning. But the real purpose of all of this stuff is really for you to get to know Mark as Mark. In other words, as in terms of what he's written so that he can do his job of introducing you to Jesus Christ. So that's why we pick apart what Mark is doing in order to understand what he's trying to tell us. So I've got, this is just my last uh, bit now before I send you off into your breakouts. So my hope for you is precisely that, to get to know more about Mark so that you can get to know Jesus better and not just to know him, but to follow him. You see, we need to move in the Gospel of Mark from being just people who know things to people who follow him. And that's like the story of Bartimaeus, which you might have already read about in chapter 10 of Mark's Gospel. He's a blind man and he's sitting beside the road, beside the way. He's a bystander or a bysitter, if you like. He's not a participant. Jesus approaches him, heals him. And the transformation in Bartimaeus is not just that he's healed, but he gets up and follows Jesus along the way. And that's a, a very significant phrase in Mark, Mark's gospel, which we'll come to in the subsequent weeks. There's a lovely picture, Husan's picture of Bartimaeus. So I want us all to be like Bartimaeus, not be people sitting by the side of the road watching it happen, but actually getting up and following Jesus along the way. So my prayer this evening, and it's a scriptural prayer, is that in the words of the apostle, may the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and perception of what is revealed to bring you to full knowledge of him. May he enlighten the eyes of your mind so that you can see what hope his call holds for you, what glories he has promised the saints will inherit and how great the power is that he has exercised for us believers. If you want to look that up later, it's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. So let's pray together that this evening we will be enlightened through the Holy Spirit and through the Gospel of Mark. So at this point, I'm talking both about the Gospel and the author. So these are the five topics I've got. Um, one is about the author, one about the date, the audience, the genre, and we'll talk about lions. Why not? So the author. Right. Well, the simple answer is who's the author of Mark? Well, we don't really know. Uh, we don't know for sure if, because the, the gospel doesn't name itself. The text is anonymous. It might have said Katamark on on that fourth century manuscript, but that's a fourth century manuscript. We don't know on the original text because we don't have it who the author was. There's nothing in the gospel itself to say, hello, I'm Mark, unlike um, unlike John, for example, who sort of refers to himself in his gospel. But the tradition is that the author is the John Mark of um, that we see in the Acts of the Apostles. Those of you who followed the Acts of the Apostles with me will remember that John Mark um, had a bit of a falling out with the Apostle Paul. Um, and But things got better and uh, we think that he uh, came back to assist the Apostle. But he also seems to be associated with Peter and his preaching. There's a reference in the first letter of Peter uh, to, to Mark. That's the tradition. Um, the, I, uh, so I don't want to scandalize my fellow Catholics here, but I just want to say in scholarly terms, there is no proof for that tradition, but there is no proof against it either. In fact, the balance of evidence would suggest that that's a fairly decent stab at the author, but we don't know for sure. What we can be confident about is that whoever Mark is, he's a Christian and he wants you to become one as well. He wants to persuade you. He's probably Jewish. I'm not going to go into why um, for now, because we will pick most of this up as we go go through. And it's probable that Greek wasn't his first language. Um, and again, we'll talk in the weeks to come and a little bit in the style session about why we think that's the case. But the key thing I want you to be reassured about is that we don't need to know who he is to know and to be able to interpret the gospel. So um, we don't know is the simple answer on the author. I'll just refer to him as Mark. 
Well, what was the date of Mark's gospel? You might be seeing a pattern here. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know for sure anyway. There is no explicit dating within the text, but the majority view is that it was written probably between 60 and 70 um, after, after Christ. So CE, by the way, um, is the same as AD. CE stands for common era. It's just a more common um, academic term for dating stuff um, in, the, in, the early, in the early world. The reason we think this is because it was about then that Peter was in Rome. He eventually got martyred, according to tradition, which is fairly well attested, um, probably around 64 um, or maybe as late as 66. And we also know that there was the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in the year 70 and by the forces of the Emperor Titus. And so these uh, elements probably give us a reasonable view of the dating of Mark's gospel. I'm not going to get into the detail of this, by the way. That's a whole session in its own right. The gospel can be no later than 150 years after Christ, because it starts to get quoted by many of the fathers, including Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, um, who are amongst the earliest. So we know for sure that it's somewhere in the second half of the first century. The biggest factor affecting the dating, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, is this is the wretched topic of what's called mark and priority or the synoptic problem, as you might have heard of it, which is, you know, because Matthew, Mark and Luke are so similar, did somebody borrow from somebody else? And the majority scholarly view is that Mark was first and that Matthew and Luke each took from Mark but I'm not going to get into that. Still less am I going to get into um, any issues about Q, which is an area of some scholarly difference. But anyway, uh, you can ask me a question about that later if you want. Again, though, the key point is we don't need to know the date to understand the content of the gospel. What's the audience? You're probably getting a feel of this by now. We don't know. We don't know for sure. Um, there is no explicit audience in the text, unlike Luke, who addresses his gospel to a chap called Theophilus. Um, but the majority view would be that it's probably the Christian community in Rome. Um, the reason for that is that most of the father's testimony says that it's about Rome and that it's associated with Peter. And that we know from Tacitus and other um, independent writers that there was um, a, the persecution under Nero, particularly um, in the late 60s was going on. So this may be a gospel written to encourage a community that was already under persecution. What we can be confident about, though, is that whoever his audience is, they can read Greek because that's what the gospel is written in. But they don't know Aramaic so that they need Aramaic phrases explaining to them. Talitha kum, if you see, saw that one, and, and a variety of other phrases. Mark does quite a lot of explaining. He even explains about some Jewish customs, though not all, interestingly enough. And there, some of the Greek terms are actually Latinate words. So the word for a coin, um, uh, one of the coins that's used in one of the parables, is actually a Latin term, and that word doesn't occur in the eastern part of the empire. So we tend to think that that suggests that the audience was in the western part of the Roman Empire. But whatever the historical audience, we're the one that matter today. And so let's talk about what we've got in common with Mark's audience. Well, quite a lot, I'd say. We're now in minority in a world where there are a lot of gods and a lot of different beliefs. Our beliefs are not popular in some quarters. Um, we haven't yet been executed in this country, but, you know, th th there are plenty of parts of the world in which that does happen. We're certainly under pressure from the secular society and even the state itself to actually compromise our values. And we are, and it's, we're showing it this evening, and it's a, a glory that it is so, that we are diverse in culture, race and social status. And that's what makes us universal, the Catholic, the small c in the Catholic Church. So that was true of Mark's audience, and it's true of us today. And aren't, my friends, aren't the questions the same? Who do you say I am, says Jesus in the eighth chapter of Mark's gospel? Who is Jesus? Why does he matter? And what am I going to do about it? Because it's one thing to know who Jesus is, but as soon as we know who Jesus is, he 
commands us and challenges us to follow him. In terms of its literary genre, well, why does that matter at all? Well, genre matters because it helps you read a work correctly. We don't read, for example, today, we don't read the Sainsbury shopping list as if it were a poem um, or, or, you know, a, a piece of history as if it were science or or. or. And it's particularly important with, with this sort of, uh, with the Gospels, because we must avoid, we're 21st century people, but we must avoid treating Mark as if he was writing this year or this century. He's, it's an ancient book <coughs> that we are now reading in the 21st century. Now, Mark calls it a Gospel, but the word euangelion, which is the Greek word for Gospel, probably refers to its content, in other words, the message that he's giving rather than the type of work. There's another Greek word that you, um, I want to alert you to, which is called bios, which is where our word biology comes from. It's, it's just the Greek word for life. And that was a type of biography that was common in Mark's time. And increasingly scholars are thinking that Mark has some elements of in common with a bios. Um, it's, and and I'll, we'll explore that more as we go, um, go through the weeks. But there are lots of other styles present in his gospel at all. So we can't really, I think, put Mark down to any single genre. But what we can be confident about is that it is a narrative work. So the and that's really important because Mark is giving you a message via a story. And we must constantly remember it's a story. We're so used to the gospel now that we forget that it's not a letter. It's not a treatise. It's not like those other books of the Bible. It is a story about Jesus and it's not and these are three important things it's not history that doesn't mean to say it's factually you know not correct that it has no historical basis it just means it's not meant to be a history and it's not biography in the modern sense we're not trying to get into somebody's motivations or anything that might be in a, a modern biography and it's not reportage so it's not the BBC website, it's not the, it's not the Times or the Guardian or, or whatever. It's, it is factual, but it, it wants to present the facts in a particular way. Okay, and finally, just before we have a, a quick break, the lion. I thought I'd just get this one out of the way. Um, so here's a picture of um, that you've seen in quite a lot of our material about Mark. Here's Mark in the Lindisfarne Gospels, and here's his lovely lion. And by the way, that I love the way, by the way, the um, the, the illuminator here has said, you know, um, St. Mark, so Hagios Marcus, there you've got him. Um, but it's got this lion here. And then just in case you don't recognize what it is, it says, this is a picture of a lion. So that's the Imago Leonis is Latin for picture of a lion. So I rather like that. Anyway, sorry, that, that's a bit of a detour. Um, and here we've got St. Mark's in Venice, if you've ever been there. Um, this is at the, uh, at the Basilica. We've got this wonderful picture of, of the... Uh, of, of, of the of, of the uh, the lion that represents Mark. So why is it why the lion? Well, there was a tradition or has been a tradition to assign symbols to each of the four evangelists. Fascinatingly, they couldn't quite agree which was which for a century or so. Um, but eventually they got themselves sorted out with Jerome and Ambrose and Gregory um, in the third and fourth centuries. And they decided that Mark was the lion. Why? Well, reasons vary, but um, the resurrection, that kind of, uh, you know, the springing to new life and the vigor there, um, maybe royalty, that Jesus is the king, um, but also perhaps a reference to the, the one who is roaring or crying in the wilderness. The Greek word there can be used to mean roar as well as cry. So um, that's in uh, the, um, Mark chapter 1, verse 3. Those symbols, by the way, the, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, they're all scriptural. You can find them in the book of Ezekiel. And then the writer of the book of Revelation actually quotes those symbols in his own vision in chapter four of the book of Revelation. Again, though, none of this has any impact on our reading of the Gospel of Mark. So just a bit of fun, really. Um, as if you're wondering why we had the lion, that's roughly why. So... Um, with all that done, that's given you a really quick um, skip tour of Mark. I suggest we have a two to three minutes break if we can, um, which is just a stretch or a um, comfort break. That big white screen with the word structure on. So I'm going to launch in now to a session um, about the structure and also some of the key themes in Mark's gospel. So 
um, here's a picture just to get us started a couple of pictures about structure so on the right hand side here i've got uh, two things i've got a a, a, um, a picture a diagram if you like a table of the high level structure which i'm going to go through in a little bit more detail in a second and i've got this curious little bit of weaving work and i'll come back to why i'm using that image as well in a second so they're the two images that i want to use to talk about structure but why does this even matter um why do we bother about structure well structure in a literary work and the gospel of mark is a literary work again I know it is the holy, uh, the holy word of God, but it is a, in its human nature, it is a literary work. And so seeing how something's structured, we see what's been included and what hasn't been included and what things appear together. And those give us a clue as to the meaning of the gospel. And that's really particularly true in Mark's gospel that is structured in a particular way. So let's have a look at it. Well, the first, really there's three big blocks in Mark's gospel. The first we could call Galilee. Um, it runs from the start to the middle of chapter eight. And it's really about Jesus going round, showing his power. He's calling and sending disciples, he's healing, he's teaching, but he's also encountering conflict and rejection. Then the middle section um, is, we probably could call it on the way. It is, literally is on the way to Jerusalem, and it's between the middle of chapter 8 and um, the end of chapter 10. And the big hinge here, I'm just highlighting it, if you can see my mouse on the screen, this big question, who do you say I am? And that's rather the hinge of Mark's gospel. It's the hinge around which the two halves of the gospel are divided. And then Jesus goes to talk about um, predicting what his fate will be and the demands because of that on people who are going to follow him and be his disciples. And then the third and final section is Jerusalem, and Jerusalem he enters into at the end of 1053 and goes all the way then to 168. Um, by the way, I'm not going to take on 168, but there are a number of different endings to Mark's gospel, which we won't take on this week, but we will come to in due course. Um, but that's really about his entry into Jerusalem, um, this um, strange discourse that he has in chapter 13 and then his passion and death and the empty tomb in chapter 16. So they're the three big blocks and there are a series of what we might call revelation events in each of those blocks that reveal who Jesus is, the baptism, the transfiguration and the crucifixion, in each of which there's a statement of this is the son of God. And the structure then actually winds back because of course in chapter 16 verse 5 we're told that Jesus will see his disciples back in Galilee. So that's the that's the broad structure of Mark's gospel. The point is, it's not just a linear gospel. It loops back on itself. And that's what we're showing by that, that arrow there. But it's also actually got all sorts of cross weaving within the structure of the gospel. So much so that one scholar has called it an interwoven tapestry. And that's the reason for my little symbol here of the tapestry that it's really like a series of threads that are tightly woven in and therefore it goes forward and it looks backward. It goes forward again, looks backward, anticipates, comes back. That's what the patterns are about. And we'll see a lot about, talk a little bit about it this evening and even more about it next week, about foreshadowing um, and about comparison and contrast. So all the time Mark's moving you forward, but he's inviting you to look across the piece as well. So that's just again, very very high level view of the structure i want to now talk about the themes in detail there are so many themes in mark that i can't talk about them all this evening so i'm going to just pick five i just want you to know that there are others and i've kind of crossed them out there i will come to these other themes in subsequent weeks each week we'll look at a very specific theme in fact but let's just start with a brief view of these five that i've highlighted on the left let's talk about jesus first so Mark is, as we said, it's all about Jesus right from the beginning. The good news of Jesus Christ, the son of God to the end. He has not. He is not here. He has been raised and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. He will see you there, says the last verses of chapter 16. So all the way through, Jesus is the center of the action, the attention and the discussion. Everybody's talking about him or he's doing things. And in fact, nearly half of the verbs in Mark's gospel are about Jesus or his teaching, or they're about Jesus doing something. 
So that's how Jesus focused it is. But really, this is about who Jesus is. And so here are some of the questions that people ask. Who is this? What? Who is this that you can do this, these things? By what authority? Some people say he's this. Some people say he's that. And of course, the chief priests say, are you the Messiah, the King of the Jews? Pilate asks him that question, too. We know the answer to these questions at the beginning of Mark, but actually it takes us the whole gospel to understand what those titles might actually mean. And it's still the same question for each one of us. Who do you say I am? I, it's a very significant question for me, this, and I'm just going to briefly give you a personal story. When I was in sixth form, um, I was very lucky to have a wonderful um, teacher. It was a Christian brother who took us on retreat and said, well, you've, you're now been, you've now gone through your O-levels and you can answer the question, who do people say I am? That's like an O-level question. All you have to do is repeat facts back. Now, Jesus is asking you the A-level question. You've got to think for yourself, who do you say I am? And that was a huge inspiration to me at the time. I've added since a question which I would call the degree level question. Do you love me? So there you go. Hope that's, uh, hope that's of use. Let's talk about Jesus's titles. So there are various titles, aren't there? Jesus Christ, the son of God, the son of man, the son of David, the king of the Jews. Lots of different things. You can read the slides about, about to see a little bit more about where these come up. These titles are actually mostly applied by other people about Jesus. And Jesus doesn't ever really use them or endorse them for himself, except for the Son of Man. But he doesn't deny them either. In fact, often when somebody says you are the Christ, as Peter does in the middle of chapter 8, he goes on to talk about what the Son of Man will do. So Jesus really trying to slips out of that. And it's the Son of Man here at the center of this picture that's really the the core of what Jesus talks about and all the expectations that go with these titles are actually inverted in the gospel so it's not about a conquering messiah it's about a suffering servant it's not about those so-called rulers who lord it over people it's about the son of man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many and Jesus is rejected by the religious elite who should have spotted the messiah because they're looking for the wrong sort of king again. And I don't have time to tell you the story of 1 Samuel chapter 8, but go and have a look at it, um, and you'll see that the, the people of Israel were very good at looking for the wrong sort of king. And Jesus is welcomed by the misfits and the Gentiles, not the, not the elite and the people who should have known. So all these titles are true of Jesus. It's just none of them are true in the way that his original hearers actually should have actually came to expect jesus inverts all those expectations in the gospel of mark secrecy that's why secrecy matters it's it's a strange thing about mark that jesus often says don't tell anybody and he actually reveals what he's talking about only in very limited contexts so in chapter four we'll see he talks about you and he's talking about the disciples here have been given the secret greek word there is mysterion that's where our word mystery comes from of the kingdom of god but everything else, up to the outside, everything's in parable, so they can't quite see what's going on. Jesus sometimes gives his disciples private instruction and reserves actions for only the three core disciples, like the transfiguration. There was a good reason, I would suggest, for Jesus to avoid open proclamation. It's because so many people would have misunderstood the various things they took him to be. A messiah and a king, not a military one. Miracle worker? Yes, but far more. Itinerant sage? Yes, but far, far more. The reality is that in Mark's gospel, no one, no one understands Jesus's identity until after the cross and the resurrection. So that's why secrecy is an interesting topic in the gospel. We know that Jesus is divine and there's lots of little, uh, there's lots of things here in mark's gospel to show us that jesus had all the divine attributes but what's often forgotten but mark particularly focuses on even more than the other uh, gospel writers is on jesus's humanity he shows compassion he loves the the, the the rich young man he shows quite a bit of indignation in a number of places and he's frustrated at the people's lack of faith 
he shows human distress at his passion. And he needs, like any person, food, rest and sleep. Jesus is truly human and truly divine in Mark's gospel. Let's talk about discipleship very briefly. There are plenty, and again, this is really sort of particularly distinctive to Mark. There's lots of quite negative portrayals of the disciples. In fact, they so much so that Luke and Matthew feel the need to tone them down when they um, pick up Mark's stories. And um, we can't have the pillars of church, of the church being uh, kind of criticized in the way that Mark does. But I can't go through all these in detail, but they range from just being a bit dim about stuff to physical weakness, rejection, and ultimately betrayal and flight and denial. But there are positive portrayals, but they're mostly in the minor characters. And they show these kind of features. They're minor characters or, which in Mark's world was pretty much the same thing, women. And women have a particularly strong role in Mark's gospel. So much so that some scholars actually think that there may have been women in prominent positions of leadership in the community that Mark was writing for. But certainly women do show some very positive um, views of discipleship, though not always actually as it happens, but, but certainly more positive than most of the men. Now discipleship in Mark's gospel is a two way thing, I would suggest. There are things that you have to set aside. You have to literally put down personal ambition, competition between each other, impurity or hedonism, pleasure, riches and privilege. And we see in episodes of the gospel, all of these episodes. And the most important thing one needs to set aside is one's own life. Tough message. But you not only need to set aside things, but you need to take them up as well. And so we can take up, most importantly, the cross. But also Jesus challenges James and John uh, uh, to, to take up his cup and the baptism with which he'll be baptized. To take on persecution, because that comes with discipleship. And primarily and particularly strongly in Mark, the importance of service of others. And of course, the proclaiming of the gospel. So some things to set aside, some things to take up. And Jesus is the pattern for all of these things. Discipleship and Jesus's identity are absolutely bound together, specifically in chapter eight, which is this pivotal chapter in the gospel where we go straight from Jesus being identified by Peter as the Christ in 829 to Jesus saying the son of man must suffer and endure and be taken to the cross. And then he immediately turns it back into what that means for others, that they must deny themselves, take up their own cross and follow him. So we go straight from the identity of Jesus to what it really means to be a disciple with Jesus as the absolute model of that. And of course, we fail as the disciples failed and all those negative portrayals. But Jesus always promises rehabilitation. There's always a way back with Jesus. And so even in advance of them failing, he says that you will go before me to Galilee. And of course, that's confirmed at his resurrection, where the young man tells them he's he is risen and he will see you in Galilee. And I'd suggest that that is the call of the gospel to each one of us. Jesus goes ahead of us to Galilee. But will we meet him there, even if that involves taking up a cross? Conflict, you see, is part of being a disciple. I can't go through this in detail, but there's all sorts of conflicts going on in the first three chapters of Mark. They range from just questions and debates to ultimately plots to kill him, which are highlighted quite early in the gospel. By chapter, by chapter three, verse six, we've already got a plot to have Jesus killed. But alongside that are the less serious but, but uh, things of the misunderstanding of those who should know better, the disciples, the family and his own area. All of these are really small elements of the bigger battle that's with Satan. So there is a cosmic battle going on in the Gospel of Mark. And that's where the testing starts with the temptation. The healings are about challenging the power of Satan. And even in the words of others, when Peter, when Peter is told, get behind me, Satan. And of course, because we have conflict, we have suffering. And the cross is not just a matter for chapter 14 and 15. 
it casts its shadow over the whole gospel. And we see that Jesus actually only starts his public ministry after John is delivered up. And we're going to talk more about that next week. There are various passion predictions, not just a future. This is what is going to happen, but this is what must happen. And the passion itself occupies a third of Mark's gospel, even though it only covers one week of his life. So we've got six chapters covering one week of his life and 10 chapters for the remaining three years of his public ministry. So that's an interesting way in which the, the, the balance of Mark shows what Mark's really, really occupied with. And oppression and suffering will inevitably happen for disciples. We need to take up our cross and be prepared to suffer trials and persecutions. It's part of preaching the gospel. And finally, let's just talk very briefly about place, which is another interesting theme that runs through Mark. So here we've got in the north, we've got Galilee. Over this side, the right-hand side of the Jordan, we've got Gentile territory, including Caesarea Philippi. And then down here, we've got Judea and Jerusalem. So Jesus's journey starts over here in Galilee, actually has a few detours this way and this way into Gentile territory. But then once he's on the way, he's heading straight for Jerusalem. So there is places operate in a few different ways in Mark. It operates in a geopolitical sense, not just as locations of action, but they have theological significance. So Galilee is where the kingdom is proclaimed. Jerusalem is about opposition. Journey is about discipleship, as well as Jesus's fidelity to the plan, and then the Gentiles that we talked about. But there are also the Jordan, the desert, the sea, and all of these have resonances with the Hebrew scriptures that we'll explore more in the weeks as we go along. There are even architectural images. The house is a significant thing. Quite a lot of teaching, privileged teaching especially, goes on in the house. And the synagogue is a place where Jesus is opposed. So just again, just having a mind for these things as you go through the gospel. Right, that's, again, apologies for the, the whistle-stop nature of the tour. That's a good point to stop now. And I think we'll go into our breakout group again. And, right, let me see if I can uh, manage to share the screen. And off we go. Folks, this is the final session for this evening in terms of my presentation. I do apologize about the pace, um, but hopefully because you've got the slides, you've got a little bit of a chance to reflect on stuff. And as I say, this is 16 chapters worth, remember. We're going to go through it week by week at a little slower pace. So let's talk about these five topics with regard to Mark. I'll just go through each of them in turn. So first of all, let's talk about Mark as an author. I, I like this one, by the way, the little picture here. This is a 17th century icon. Um, um, and he, you see he's leaning the book on the lion's head. The lion doesn't look very happy about it. But anyway, there you are. Lion's got to have a role somewhere in all of these things. So one of the things I wanted to start with is there's actually been different views in scholarship over the uh, period about Marx. How good is Marx as an author? Um, in the 19th century, the uh, period of great German scholarship, um, Marx was regarded as a fairly artless and unlettered uh, character. In fact, somebody just regarded him as no more than a cut and paste artist of various traditions that he would have picked up. Um, but I think in the 20th century, we they uh, scholars began to see him much more as a very skilled storyteller, really. So how can you be both of these things? How can you be artless and unlettered on the one hand and a skillful um, narrator on another? Well, I think you can, actually, uh, because they're not mutually exclusive. You can be skilled in narrative, in other words, in telling stories, but less sophisticated in the actual sentences that you write. Uh, but I think Mark still, despite some of that uh, lack of sophistication, still has a, a kind of rather appealing directness to the way he writes. Um, actually, Mark is rather smoothed out in English translation often. People miss out the dodgy bits or the slightly awkward bits. And um, this is where I wanted to, and I get no commission for this, by the way, but I wanted to recommend to you um, Father Nicholas King's translation of the New Testament. And um, if you're looking for a birthday or early Christmas present, oh, oh, why not just spend 20 quid on it in Amazon or however much it costs? It will be the best uh, relatively small amount of money you ever spend. I think it's a wonderful translation because it's not like any other translation. It tries to render what it's like to read Mark. And so have a look at that. Um, I'll be referring to that as we go from week to week. Um, certainly worth having it in the sessions as you go along. 
And Matthew and Luke also try and smo smooth out Mark's rough edges. It's brilliant. Matthew actually uses about 95% of Mark's content, but he hardly ever follows him verbatim. I've got this picture of Matthew kind of taking Mark's gospel and sort of holding his nose at it as he picks it up and uses it, because he really doesn't like Mark's style at all. Uh, Luke is a little bit kinder and kind of goes with the flow a little bit more. So let's talk about Mark's energy, which I just alluded to. Let's talk about pacing, first of all, because one of the things we're going to see, and I'll particularly talk about this next week when we look at chapter one, is this rapid movement and changes of scene. There's lots of sentences that are just joined by and. In fact, 85 percent of sections in the gospel actually start with the word and or the, in Greek it's kai okay and so um, in the English translations you won't always see that because sometimes they miss it out sometimes they use now or but or different words but it's the same Greek word underneath another thing about the rapidity is that Jesus is in a real hurry particularly in the first three chapters he's calling disciples he's healing he's teaching he's praying he's debating he's traveling he just keeps, keeps going. But despite all this frantic activity, rather like your presenter, it slows down towards the end. And so on the on the way section, we actually begin to see specific days being marked out, which is in contrast between the rather vaguer time frames of the first half of the gospel. And in the passion, we get down to hours. So Mark... It's not the mark of the religious elite in chapters 11 and 12. So Mark wants you to see these patterns and he wants you to see that he's grouping certain types of content together to bring a particular picture to, to, the, to the fore. He also uses a technique we might call framing, where he kind of surrounds a certain story with particular blocks or themes. I haven't got time to go through this in the detail, but there are healings of blind people either side of the big on the way section. Um, there are women who come and give service to Jesus at the start and at the end of the Passion. There are also repeated images and phrases. So often when Jesus starts teaching, he's got crowds around him and he's near the sea. It's often a sign that Jesus is going to start teaching. And sometimes, to make it absolutely clear, Mark says to him, to you, and he said to them, and off he goes. So there are those little kind of images. And then there is something called the Mark and Sandwich. So here's, here's a sandwich for you. The posh word for this is intercalation, but Mark and sandwich is much uh, more memorable. It's where Mark starts a narrative, then goes on to another one and resumes the original narrative. There are so many of these in Mark that it's clearly characteristic of him. So, for example, in chapter five, and again, we will look at this in more detail in a few weeks time when we get to it. But off he goes to um, Jairus to go and heal his daughter but on the way in the crowd there's a woman who's had a bleeding for years and she touches Jesus and she's healed and that's all happens and then sets that aside back onto Jairus his daughter's dead don't bother no Jesus says we'll carry on and he goes and raises the girl from death so he got the Jairus story with this story of the woman in the middle why well Mark wants to show one the meaning of one story by means of another and it helps reinforce the message of each story again don't worry that you don't get all of this right now we'll be there are seven instances we'll be going through this quite a few times week by week there are number patterns in mark again not enough time to go through them so i'm just going to put some of these on screen we have pairs of incidents like the two healings of blind men that we we're talking about there are threes passion predictions three affirmations of jesus as son of god failings of disciples all in threes and there are four parables, as I said, five conflict stories and five debates. Why does Mark have number patterns? Oh, sorry about that. That was me being, oh, oh, Liffis. Oh, yeah, you're having fun there, Liffis, give, giving us a bit of annotation. Um, so um, these these parables are, these, these numbers are to reinforce the meaning by repetition. Again, this is a technique associated with, um, with oral uh, teaching. It helps you understand and remember things because they're in a pattern. And therefore, uh, foreshadowing, um, we can look at this is basically anticipating where the narrative is going to go by a particular image. Again, very characteristic oral storytelling. Who knows Red Riding Hood? Remember the story of Red Riding Hood? Don't you, when you go out, Red Riding Hood, beware of the wolf. And then she gets to meet the wolf. 
That's a classic foreshadowing technique. And you have it in oral storytelling because it makes it easier to remember the story. And you remember what the end is like because you've been told what's going to happen in the beginning. So this is this looping effect that we have in, in the... And so we see a few examples of this. Violence opposition to Jesus occurs as early as chapter three and then is constantly repeated at different points uh, during the... Uh, during the gospel and also about um these the how john the baptist fate relates to jesus more of that next week because we're going to specifically talk about that uh, in chapter one and just very briefly about repetition there are some key words that um, weave their threads through the gospel and again this is meant to connect things and see themes arising all of these by the way you might not see all of these in your english translation i'm referring to where the greek word is the same the English translations don't always use the same word. But again, from week to week, I'm going to be pointing out some of these as we go along. And we're going to start with one of them next week. And there sometimes is repetition within a passage. So drawing attention to the significance. Again, you can see those as we go and look them up um, because you'll have the presentation to look at. So patterns are really important to Mark. And there are various others that, that we'll see as we go along. This was just a taster. And I'm so sorry that it has to be so quick, um, that, 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 but it will give, give you a feel for what's going on. Don't worry if you don't spot them all. Nobody does. But, you know, the, 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 the idea is that we just become alert to seeing these things as we go along. And I will be, uh, week by week, I'll be pointing out some of these examples. This is part of our signposting so that we get that feel for as we go along the journey. Ah, oh, yes recognize that kind of pattern now that it's being pointed out good apologies i ran over by three minutes but that gives us i think a good point at which to stop 